welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us during this session. Uh, we are happy to have you here and we hope that you'll be able to um, get tips during this initiative we have planned for you. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few guidelines to ensure that everyone has a positive experience during this session. Um, please keep your microphone on mute to reduce distractions and ensure clarity for all participants. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function to send them and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. This session has been recorded for the benefit of those who cannot attend this live training. By participating, you agree to be recorded. The recording, along with the slides and additional resources, will be sent today in the next PD Tiga newsletter. Welcome to the third professional development webinar in November. Time to shine, developing your teaching portfolio. During this session, Professor Joni Mitchell, um, professional development specialist at the Light Center, will teach us how to create a professional portfolio to showcase and provide documented evidence of your teaching effectiveness from a variety of sources. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Joni, uh, she has been working with me for the last three months, um, but she has a really beautiful bio that I would like to share with you. Joni Mitchell is an accomplished online educator, trainer, and learning developer with a decade of experience in higher education. She holds a bachelor's degree in English and a master of arts degree in sociology, both of which have been instrumental in shaping her understanding of learning theory, online teaching, and inclusive learning spaces. Joni has successfully led multiple professional development initiatives, including designing and delivering workshops for new higher orientation programs, sharing best practices in online teaching, and enhancing student support for non-traditional students. Joni is a passionate advocate for quality education and is dedicated to fostering personal and professional growth in others. She's currently the professional development specialist here at West Coast University in the Light Center. Welcome again, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And Professor Mitchell, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Evelyn. Thank you. <laughs> I get to work with Dr. Shao Ojeda, so every day is fun. Eve, um, thank Eve. you, everyone. <laughs> Eve, Eve, yes. <laughs> Uh, I uh, am so glad you're here, and if you're watching this recording later, thank you so much for watching. Um, as Eve said, we are going to be talking all about your portfolio. Uh, so the title of our workshop today is Time to Shine, Developing Your Teaching Portfolio. And I want to start just by, uh, and I'm going to be trying to control Evelyn's uh, sharing here. Let's see. Zoom is always... Let's start by talking about the purpose of this workshop. And so this all came about um, because when I first started, um, Eve and I were talking about possible, you know, workshop ideas, what would help our faculty both in and out of the classroom. So our purpose today, um, by the end of this webinar, you will be able to explain the significance of a teaching portfolio in the academic field, um, identifying key components that make an effective teaching portfolio, and also being able to leverage your portfolio for career advancement. There's a variety of reasons reasons that a person would want to use a teaching portfolio. And so we're going to talk about some of those today. We'll also, um, you'll be able to st uh, start to develop a personalized strategy. So it's really important when we're talking about teaching portfolios that you have a personalized strategy to create, assemble, and share your portfolio. And you'll also will be able, you'll be familiar with the uh, the options that you'll be able to utilize. There's many, many tools that can help you um, and platforms to create, house, or save your portfolio and to share your portfolio. So those are important considerations as well. And we'll be talking a little bit about that. Let's see, next slide here. Hmm. Our agenda today is to explore the, first we're gonna be exploring the importance of the teaching portfolio. And we'll also discuss the important considerations that you'll want to make as you start to think about your strategy for your teaching portfolio and the steps you'll want to take. 
We'll share how the Light Center can help you in your teaching portfolio, aka I'm going to do a proud, shameless plug for our wonderful Light Center. And we'll also talk about how you can share your portfolio. We'll have a discussion. And then if we have some time for Q&A, I'm certainly going to be uh, here. Um, you know, uh, we're here together for an hour, so you can uh, certainly ask your questions. But really, this is throughout. So if you have a question, I'm very conversational in my style. So um, you don't feel like you can't interrupt or raise your hand or pop your question into the chat. Uh, we will be checking the chat as well. So if there's something I say and you're, oh, actually I saw on this slide, it said this, um, I'm always happy to answer questions. Hmm. It stopped me from controlling the thing here. Oh, no, they're good. First, we'll talk about why you should create a teaching portfolio. So there's many reasons why you should think about creating a teaching portfolio. Um, and a lot of times, one of the issues that we run into is, you know, first kind of think about, well, what is this teaching portfolio? What is it for? So teaching portfolio, by definition, is simply a collection of documents showcasing your teaching and research practices, your philosophies, your achievements, um, and there's a variety of ways to do that. It's also a reflective tool for self-assessment and determining your career growth and your trajectory, and that's an important part of what we're going to talk about today when it comes to designing a teaching portfolio. It's very different from a CV. Um, CV is part of it, um, and it's also extremely different from a resume because you're not taking a single snapshot of where you are. We're going to be looking at the whole trajectory of your career and where you're headed. Um, and it's also a comprehensive record of your improvement in your development. So keeping those things in mind um, as we go forward is really important. It's a means of communicating your teaching skills, your methods, and your professional development. You know, as we keep going back to that professional development, it showcases your experiences, your competencies for self-evaluation and growth. And most importantly, a good teaching portfolio tells your story. So every teaching portfolio is individual, it's unique to you, and it tells your story. Do you need a teaching portfolio? Now, this is an important question for all faculty to ask themselves. Um, teaching portfolios are often discussed through the lens of K through 12. They're associated with, you know, elementary teaching um, or high school teaching, but they're also necessary for university and college faculty as well. So there's quite a few reasons why. One is showing your professional development. A teaching portfolio gives you an opportunity to reflect critically on your teaching methods, career, and your goals. It helps you identify your strengths and areas of improvement. Um, it's important for job applications, tenure, and promotions. A lot of faculty don't know this, but teaching portfolios are often a key component in the hiring and promotion process. Um, you know, how you present yourself is a huge part of your teaching portfolio. They provide a structured and persuasive evidence based on, ba uh, based to support claims of teaching effectiveness and engagement in professional development activities. They also act as a repository that you can easily pull fund in the job application process. So we all know that um, if you are adjunct and you've applied for different campuses, some of those applications are incredibly long. And so having one place that you can pull information from is really useful. Um, so that's what we want to think about when we're putting together our teaching portfolio. It displays your recognition and awards. A well-crafted teaching portfolio can be used to support applications for teaching awards and grants. It displays the ones you've already uh, received, and it helps you apply for one's uh, awards and grants that you would like to apply for when you need to share achievements and innovative practices in teaching um, or research. A little bit of a lag here on the sharing. My apologies. Do you want me to help you? Yes, please. It keeps uh, okay. removing the, I'll just ask. Um, so I can continue in this process of do you need a teaching portfolio? Why is this important for faculty? Um, it gives you the documentation of your teaching practices. Portfolios serve as a repository of uh, for the collection of teaching materials, methodologies, and assessments. Um, this documentation can be invaluable for sharing with peers, contributing to the scholarship of teaching and learning, and maintaining a record of teaching activities over time. And it's also good for networking and collaboration. And so this is one of the areas that we want to talk about how we use our portfolio. Portfolios can be shared with peers for feedback. Um, it can also create opportunities for collaboration and the exchange of ideas. This can lead to new teaching or consulting partnerships and opportunities to contribute to interdisciplinary projects. So um, 
I don't know if you've ever been uh, at a conference. I was at a conference recently where um, a gentleman actually had his entire portfolio on a, through a QR code. And so he, he was like, connect with me on LinkedIn. There's my portfolio. Oh, and by the way, you can also read my portfolio here. And so it was really interesting how he had uh, built out his teaching portfolio and devised a really good strategy to share it. Um, next slide, please. We want to think about the key components of a teaching portfolio. So you always want to make sure that you have your teaching philosophy statement, and um, we can talk. We'll talk a little bit more about those. You can actually do an entire workshop just on your <laughs> teaching philosophy uh, and and how you communicate that, um, if necessary. Depending on how you display your portfolio, you might think about a table of contents. Um, we want to make sure that we always have narratives, commentary, and annotations. Those are going to be the various descriptions that you have when it comes comes to um, uh, displaying your work in your teaching portfolio. You will be uh, making sure that you have evidence of teaching effectiveness in there. Uh, evaluations, those can be student evaluations, peer evaluations, department evaluations, and professional development activities. Again, conferences, committees that you've served on, workshops, workshops that you have hosted, um, all of those professional development activities that you've either led or taken part in um, are important. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. And then any awards and recognitions, uh, you always wanna make sure that you include those in your teaching portfolio as well. So let's talk a little bit about developing a teaching portfolio. First, you wanna think about these important considerations. So we've talked a little bit about the components of a good teaching portfolio, but these are important considerations. I'll probably spend quite a bit of time on this slide alone um, because just thinking about the process of a teaching portfolio, the use of your teaching portfolio is gonna help you going into uh, this, this process of developing the teaching portfolio. So first, do you have some goals or strategy for your teaching portfolio? What is it that you want to use it for? What are you going to, who, who's going to see it? Um, is there a reason? Are you, are you trying to um, uh, take on more uh, teaching roles, part-time teaching roles, full-time teaching roles? Uh, is there a specific need in your department that you want to approach the department about, a, a coordinator role or something of that nature? So thinking about those professional goals, you know, do you have management goals? You know, are you looking into maybe I can become a dean or maybe I can, you know, move up or into other areas um, and the strategy to use it? what is your career story? And really thinking about what has brought you to the point where you are in your career. What is it that you've done? What, if, what, if, what research have you done? Um, what type of students do you enjoy working with? Uh, you know, demographics, uh, age groups, uh, specific subjects, what classes do you like to teach? You know, thinking about your teaching story can really help you uh, going into this process of developing your teaching portfolio. And then who is your audience? So different institutions, different departments, and different purposes, uh, different organizations are going to be those audiences. So if you're applying for a grant, um, you want to make sure that your teaching portfolio has certain elements um, that may be a little bit different from if you're applying to, you know, teach in a in the or for a consult in the K through 12 system. So thinking about who is the audience, who's going to be seeing this portfolio potentially one day is really important going into this. How do you want to show your potential contributions to that institution project or field? And what are the expectations that they have? What are their expectations? So this is really important because sometimes I work with faculty who've come to me and said, um, you know, I have 15 years of my field, I have a PhD from this school, um, and I just, you know, for some reason they don't want to offer me an adjunct class, or they won't, um, I can't seem to get the attention of this grant writer or, or this institution. And we'll take a look at their portfolio and see that even though they've worked in the area for a long time, they're lacking the evidence that shows that they know how to use an LMS, right? So they're applying for online teaching jobs, but they have no um, either they don't have any skills or they have, are not displaying their skills in teaching in particular LMS. So that's really important to think about. What are the in, uh, expectations of the institutions and the people that you are uh, going to be getting your portfolio in front of? Are there things in your field that you need to showcase? This is another important one. I can't speak to what every discipline requires. However, I could say that uh, what a professor um, of an MBA program might want to include in his teaching portfolio is going to be very different from what a professor of English or sociology or um, digital marketing might want to include. And so it's really important to think about 
if there's specific things in your field that are important to showcase? Um, are there specific lessons that you've, or assessments that you've performed with students that you wanna make sure that you have in there to show knowledge in your field? Where will you house your portfolio? And this is, uh, we're gonna talk about some options for that um, extensively, because that's a really important consideration that teachers don't always think about. Faculty don't always think about um, okay, I've got this wonderful document, I've collected everything, everything is lovely and scanned and in beautiful PDFs, but how do I share it and where do I house it? And so we'll talk about some options. Digital versus paper copies. Um, this is an ongoing debate for some people in the field. Obviously, uh, you know, I'm of the newer generation, everything's digital, 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 but there's definitely some benefits to some hard copies as well. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then who can help you with accountability for your portfolio? So sometimes, you know, we all know we're all remote uh, employees. Uh, many of the, you know, adjuncts that I work with are remote adjuncts. They, um, you know, we kind of work in our offices, we work in our silos, we don't share much. And so having people that we can work with, having people that we can call up and lean on and have these conversations with is incredibly important. So it's a, it's a good consideration to think about who can we, who can help me with this? Okay, next slide, please. So then we wanna move on to gathering our documents. Now this is a pretty big list, but it's by no means a complete one. <laughs> um, but we wanna start with you know, our curriculum vita um, or vitae, depending on who you are, uh, your CV, okay? Uh, that includes everything, including your teaching philosophy. If you don't have a teaching philosophy, this is a wonderful place to start. I do have some tools that I can share with you today. And um, of course, if you contact me later, I, I have even more tools, so resources. Um, but it's very important to think about your teaching philosophy. You have naturally want to have your education on there, the research you've done, your work experiences, including the courses that you've taught. A lot of times when I'm working with faculty, they'll list the school. They'll list the department, but they won't list specific course subjects or even the course description. Um, and it's really good to have both on there because you know CVs can be as long as you need them to. Areas of expertise, conference attendance and presentation and presentations, publications, awards, service on committees, curriculum development that you've worked on, professional associations that you belong to or have had, um, and professional references. It is always nice to have a page of references in there. Everybody doesn't require it. But remember, we're just gathering documents to put together this portfolio. Just because you have the portfolio doesn't mean you always have to share the portfolio, the entire portfolio. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. Specifically for online teaching for your CV, you want to think about your skills that you're listing as well. So this is a huge difference from a traditional CV for faculty who teach on campus. You, they, maybe it doesn't matter that they've taught in you know, Moodle or, or Canvas or Blackboard, um, but you wanna make sure that you list those skills, that you, are, you show your uh, capabilities with Zoom. If you have some specific talents in Canva to design um, interesting uh, announcements to students or whatever the case may be, we want to share that technology and have those skills listed. Um, it's not typical for a research CV. Um, in addition to that, you wanna take into consideration which sections you would want to edit depending on the use of what you're gonna have. So keeping that in mind, sometimes faculty like to highlight um, particular sections that they would edit. Um, this is because whenever you are using your portfolio and you have a specific reason for using that portfolio, we want to make sure that um, you go back and edit those areas again, because we wanna make uh, our portfolio appealing to that audience. So it can't just say the same thing for everybody. You wanna think of the areas that you can change. Um, depending on your purpose, you may also want to have a shorter one to two page resume. Um, if you are applying for certain grants um, or certain roles in um, staffing roles, for instance, my role um, is not a teaching role, it's a staff role, um, don't need to send the whole CV. So if you have 20 pages of CV, you want to take out the parts that are relevant to that role and to that purpose and fit them into a one to two page resume. It's good to have that handy. Um, your unofficial transcripts. A lot of times when you're applying for roles, they'll ask, you know, when did you, uh, how long were you in your degree? What year did you graduate? These types of things. Some of that stuff is coming off of our application processes, but we do still see it now. It's just nice to have it handy. Um, teaching materials you've developed and uh, reflections of their effectiveness. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, the statements that you want to include with those teaching materials. It tells the story. Samples of your syllabi you've worked on, student evaluations or feedback, department evaluations, letters of recommendations, journal articles that you've been a part of, programs of conf from conferences that you've attended. So as you gather those things up, just start to make folders on your computer or um, if you have hard copies, get them scanned. And this is kind of the process for starting to build out your teaching portfolio. 
Next slide, please. Gathering doc documents part two. This is what I like to call the dig deeper section. Um, so many faculty will come to me and they'll say, okay, I've got everything. Here's my CV, here's my reviews, here's my transcripts, everything on that first list you saw. And I'll say, okay, let's go back and find some more things. <laughs> and here's why your email has so many things that you probably don't even remember doing. Certificates um, that you can you can uh, save these. We create them and then you save them. Um, you can also have, uh, sometimes you have to go back and get them, you know, made if you've worked, uh, I've worked with organizations and said, hey, you know, uh, do you guys, you guys don't have a Credly badge? I'd like to put this on my LinkedIn or I'd like to share this here. Um, statements, contracts, uh, the, any feedback, maybe you forgot that you had a really great student evaluation. Um, you had that class that just really rocked a year ago. You want to go back and find that evaluation. Don't just use the current one. Go find the good ones, the ones that you really, really like, the best um, displays of your ability, right? Any praise? Okay, a lot of times our students email us directly. Thank you so much, Professor So-and-so, for helping me with this. This was a huge help. Hey, Professor So-and-so, I passed the exam or I passed the certification. Thank you so much for your help. Save those emails. Put them in a folder. Find them and save them. Um, and then projects you've worked on. So, of course, you have emails from various projects that you've worked on. Make sure you pull those. Check out your calendar. So, look for conferences you've attended, workshops you've hosted, and then use your calendar. This is a tip I like to include. Make a, a weekly or biweekly appointment with yourself. Okay, it doesn't have to be weekly. Biweekly at the most, okay, when you're starting this process to reflect on the week and make notes of what you can add to your CV um, or your portfolio during that time. And one great way to do this as you're keeping track just day to day is using an app like OneNote, Notes or Evernote, um, which are all note-taking note apps that talk to both your phone and the computer. So any one of those, if you're not using those, please do um, and just put one for teaching portfolio. And anytime you think of something, throw it on there and you can come back and get evidence for it later. So there's some tips for that. Next slide, please. I have a lot here, so I'm trying to make sure I uh, keep track of time here. And it's shameless plug time. I told you this was coming. It's absolutely here. How the Light Center can help. So uh, the more I've, I've been with Westcliff for a few months now. Um, and I noticed that when I'm talking to faculty, sometimes they don't know about everything that we can help them with and what we can do with them for them. Um, how the Light Center can help. So first, I just have the website there. So definitely do check out that website and uh, read about our wonderful um, directors and our, and our dean who can really um, guide us through some really fantastic initiatives on our campus. But specifically, um, think about the library and the digital resource center. So if you're kind of stuck and you're thinking like, hmm, not sure where I want to direct myself research wise lately, we have a fantastic librarian um, who's happy to meet with you and talk to you about your goals and how the library can be of assistance with that. Um, we also have our curriculum champion team. One of the things that's really special about Westcliff University is that the curriculum champions are open to receiving feedback about curriculum and and that there are sometimes opportunities to be a subject magic subject matter expert aka a SME um, for the for our courses so these are opportunities that can really help build out your CV I know they don't come up all the time but it's very special that Westcliff has that because um, for part-time faculty because a lot of universities don't they save it only for the full-time faculty so do keep that in mind um, and then, of course, our professional development department, uh, led by uh, Evelyn here, and uh, I'm on the team too, so you'll see me around. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, training on a variety of topics through our live webinars, our professional learning communities, and the, of course, spoke, our LMS. So you can go in there at any time and train on areas, um, earn badges, earn certificates, and these are things that can help build out your professional, um, your professional teaching portfolio. Okay, we have uh, resources for classroom practices. If you're thinking, I haven't done anything different in the classroom in a while, what do I want to showcase? Come and check out our resources um, on how to use technology, how to perform different tasks, attend a webinar like this one. And, you know, think about how you can use that as uh, not just for your students, but also as an opportunity to display your knowledge in, in the classroom and your ability in the classroom. Um, we obviously provide certificates whenever you complete one of these webinars, whenever you attend a webinar. Um, and then we're also looking at how we can use our LMS to provide badges. And we're hoping to uh, next year to have some LinkedIn capabilities with that. So you'll be able to show that you um, are actually doing these webinars to in a, in a professional setting, a professional uh, social media page like your, your LinkedIn. 
Uh, classroom visits. We do classroom visits in general for new faculty and when we're requested. And But if you feel like, you know what, um, I'm not getting much feedback right now. I'd like to know, you know, what I can do to engage my students more. We help with that. Um, we also provide, as you saw on the very first slide when you came into the meeting today, professional development funding. Um, we can make recommendations for committee and service um, on the campus if you find that that's something that is you're, you are lacking or you'd like to have more of in your portfolio, especially if it's important to the organizations that you're going to be showing your portfolio to. Um, and then we also have, and this is again really special because not every university has this for adjunct faculty members, opportunities to perform paid training. So if you host a webinar like this, you can actually get paid to do it. Um, and that is a really great addition to put onto your CV and in your teaching portfolio. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about putting it all together. You've gathered everything, you've thought about your story, you have your experience, and we wanna think about how we are saving and sharing your portfolio. So you're gonna collect your materials, you've written some of your statements on your background, you've reflected on your experiences, you have your colleagues and your mentors that you can ask for feedback on your materials, maybe you've shown them a few things. Um, and now you're gonna, and maybe even you've looked at different examples of teaching portfolios. And so what I recommend, um, various unipart, uh, university department websites sites. Um, a lot of universities have centers for teaching and learning. Um, a lot of departments, if you know of a specific department at a university, you might go in and read and see how their faculty are displaying their portfolio, uh, their uh, CVs. Um, and sometimes they also have an entire portfolio. You want to look at samples of portfolios on YouTube, even the K through 12 ones, because there's really some useful um, tidbits that you can use as university faculty. Websites like weareteachers.com have wonderful tutorials. Faculty Focus has some great articles on teaching portfolios. Yeah. Um, you want to go ahead and look at those samples. And so as I was putting this webinar together today, I um, was like, oh, I should show some samples. And then I'm like, actually, the variety of what is out there <laughs> is so huge these days with technology. I don't want to limit you to that. I really would love it if you could go and look at different teaching portfolios and kind of think about how you want yours to look specific to your field. Um, you'll also need to think about how you are making edits and adding information as necessary. Because remember, we're going to be telling a story over time. This is not a one-time snapshot. So you're going to consider versioning, um, which is just when you have you know, your folders, OK, for this organization, depending on what you're doing. Um, you know, having your different versions uh, saved and labeled well, and your naming convention. So making sure that it doesn't just say CV or CV Mitchell or whatever, put the date in there, put a little underscore and get the date on there so you know what it is, or CV WU underscore Mitchell. So that's my Westcliff University CV. Um, oh, somebody said Chronicle of Higher Ed, surprised it wasn't mentioned. That's a good one too. Um, it gotcha. wasn't mentioned because I ran out of room on the slide, <laughs> but that's a great one. <laughs> yes. Um, Inside Higher Ed is also another one. There are many, many um, opportunities to, to research uh, your teaching portfolio and to look for samples. That's a great one. Thank you, Jennifer. Next slide, please. So when you're thinking about where to house and share your portfolio, you want to decide, you know, where will it live? Okay, so this is where everything you're going to pull from it, you're going to share from it. So it's important to think about that. If you're doing um, job applications, you will want to, you know, um, you know, have those samples ready, you know, so that those application processes <laughs> try to make them as fast as possible, because some of those applications are very long. Um, consider the uses for it and how will you share it. Um, if it's a folder in a meeting, if it's a document that you need for a grant application, remember I said that there are still uses for uh, those hard copy portfolios um, or sections of a portfolio in hard copy. Um, if you're going to do a link on your LinkedIn profile, you want to make sure that you are uh, that digital space that you're using um, is easy to click to um, or in an email. Okay. Uh, so your digital options, we're going to talk about more, but here's just a few. Digital website, online platform, cloud service. Some people like to save a lot of their documents in a cloud. Um, and uh, paper, binders, filing systems, etc. Keep in mind, you don't have to choose just one method. Most of the faculty I've worked with use a mix of these methods, depending on what they're doing, um, depending on their field and a variety of other things. Next slide, please. And this is one of those options. So websites, if you want to build yourself a website, um, we have options like Wix, WordPress, Google Site, 
Um, the pros of it, of course, is that it offers a range of design and style options. If you have a website or if you if you have one now or you're considering one, the creativity um, and the options are, are endless, right? It can be user friendly and easy to update. That's really nice. Um, you want to make sure that you have something that you can go in and update often. Um, and you can, you know, integrate multimedia and interactive elements like videos and slideshows. If you want to upload videos of you teaching, you know, you can do that, uh, you know, with respect to privacy, um, you know, and so that's really nice when you are kind of how big you want to go. Um, and then of course, all of these options, Wix, WordPress, Google site, they tend to be, um, they range in cost, um, but usually it's not too high. Uh, the cons is that sometimes they require a certain level of technical skill to set up and maintain. A lot of faculty I work with, they say, yes, I want a website. And then they start to get into that WordPress um, web design and they realize that they need help. Um, it's not that they don't have technical skills, they do, but it could just be a little time consuming to get things exactly how they want it to look, but it can be worth it. So uh, sometimes it does require a little bit more technical skill. It can involve ongoing costs for hosting and domain registration. And then it really depends on like the platform's uh, stability and then of course, internet access for viewing. Next, we have uh, the option of making sure that everything is saved in PDFs. And so sometimes I see this, especially through university websites. Obviously, everything is preserved in the document. That's what we all love about PDFs. Um, you can include links uh, if you are, you know, if you want some, to put something in there to link back to your, uh, like your LinkedIn page or maybe another piece of your portfolio. Um, and that formatting stays consistent. It can be easily shared and viewed on most platforms without much, without many changes. Um, and then doers not, viewers, excuse me, do not need special software beyond a PDF reader, which pretty much comes standard on everybody's computer now, right? Challenges can be that, uh, you know, it takes a lot to update, <laughs> to pull the page down, update the new page. Um, usually it uh, represents that static snapshot. And remember, that's what we're trying to get away from. We want to make sure that our portfolios are fluid and growing with us. And the files can be really large. And so sometimes it's, uh, you know, trying to, you know, have people link out to things from a PDF document can be quite a hassle. Um, so my preference is actually this last one here. Next slide, please the Google Drive. So <laughs> if you've been with Westcliff for more than five days, you know that we love our Google Drives. Um, we have a variety of Google Drives and I encourage everybody to learn more about Google Drives. I actually have never used Google Drives more than I have in this role. And I'm learning so much about the uh, capability and, and what we want to do and, and how we can use Google Drives. Um, first, you have the ability to save, organize, um, everything. So when we're talking about those different versions, those different folders, you want to change the naming conventions. Um, this is great for versioning. Option to create specific folders for sharing, right? So you don't have to send anybody your full portfolio. Maybe you want to pull a few pieces out, put in a special folder just for them and send them that link. Um, and it can you can selectively share certain parts of the portfolio that are most relevant for that viewer. Okay, it's easy to access when applying for roles. The cons are that it may require more um, content. To, then that's where those statements come in. You want to make sure that there's enough context uh, for what you're sharing. And so having some statements on like, you know, this lesson was, you know, a little bit of reflection in there about how the lesson went, what your goals were with the lesson, um, making sure that you have that. So it takes a little bit more footwork. Um, the interface could be less intuitive for those who are unfamiliar with Google Drive. I'm a prime example of this. I thought I knew how to use Google Drive, and now that I'm using it every day, I'm learning some areas that I can practice in. So, you know, making it as clean as possible, you know, sometimes linking right to a specific document in a Google Drive can sometimes help. Um, but if you are dealing with somebody who, who understands Google Drives, it's typically not an issue. And then access is dependent on having a Google account and internet connectivity. That's not always true. Um, there are some ways around that, but you want to, uh, you know, kind of be aware when it comes to, to sharing documents, some limitations. Um, okay, next slide. All right, good. I was checking my time here. Um, let's see, how many people do we have here? Because I actually can't see on my end. Well, oh, we have a great, great group. Okay. I was trying to think if we wanted to do breakout sessions. I know we love our breakout sessions, but actually I was wondering if we could just do this in this room. What do we think? Got a few people on camera nodding. I want you to leave this webinar ready to take action. This is incredibly important. So um, you don't have to say it out loud. You can raise your hand. You can unmute yourself. Um, you also don't have to come on camera for those of you who are not currently on camera. I just want you to think about one takeaway or bit of information that stood out to you. 
Um, I would love for you to think of one thing that you can do next week towards your portfolio. Um, one thing that you can think about doing next term. So remember, this is a story over time of your career. So we don't want to just think like, okay, here's my portfolio. There it is. It's up. You have my CV. You have everything. What's something that you can do next term that you're looking forward to? Ooh, I'm going to teach this class. I might try this. Um, and then one thing you can schedule to do by the end of next year. Okay. And remember using that calendar. So if you know that there is a conference, um, uh, oh, great question, uh, Professor Owlin. Um, we'll get to that. <laughs> One thing that you can do to schedule before the end of next year um, is a really important. So be thinking about that. I'm going to hop over to the chat here. And is there anyone I can hire to do this for me? The short answer is yes, absolutely. The long answer is be extremely careful. <laughs> Um, everybody's a web developer now. Uh, <laughs> and so you want to be really careful with that. Um, do I personally have people that I would recommend? Yes. Um, you want to be very cautious. If you're going to hire somebody, uh, do your research is all I can say. Okay. Um, if they're charging you 20 bucks to put up a website, it's probably because they're going to put up a $20 website. So just be careful with that. Um, you want to be clear on what you want. So you still need to go back and do your research on what you want your portfolio to look like, what you want to have included in it. What are the expectations of your field? How easy do you want to be able to pull from that portfolio? These are all things that you will need to communicate to somebody who's building something for you, whether that's a Google Drive, a website, whatever the case may be. Also shop around. Um, I've had I've worked with quite a few faculty who uh, a handful of them have gone on to Fiverr and just regretted hiring the first person. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Fiverr is a freelance website. You can get um, online help. Uh, it, it's sometimes very affordable because sometimes the employees are in other countries where the cost of living isn't as high. Um, but you want to be very cautious with that and you need to be able to see samples of their work which is sometimes tricky to do because a lot of times people will pretend that work is theirs when it isn't. Um, even better if you can get references. Uh, so there is a review process on Fiverr. Um, however, that's also, you know, just keep in mind that everything's on the internet. Not everything is real on the internet. So do your, do your homework. Um, but yes, if you have somebody that you trust, that you feel really gets your vision for what you want to accomplish, preferably somebody who's worked in academia, um, either like in a staffing role or uh, maybe they're a professor who likes to do this type of thing on the side, um, then that's, you know, that's an option as well. Um, if you would like some references, my email's on there. I'm happy to refer people to you. Uh, just know that they are not affiliated with Westcliff University and Westcliff University is not responsible for that in any way. There, set it on camera. So, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to refer you to somebody. And um, yes, there are loads of freelancers out there who can help you with this. Just got to make sure that you still put in your end of the work. Hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have another question on that, Professor Owlett. Any other questions? Excellent. All right, who wants to go first on my takeaway list here? Take action list. If you just want to answer one, then just answer one of the bullets. You don't have to answer all four. Oh my gosh, this is like my students, you guys. <laughs> uh, really, it is very good information. And uh, I like how you explained at the beginning the difference between resume, CV, and um, the portfolio, teaching portfolio. However, maybe we need more time if personally, because I have a 27 teaching experience and I was located in different countries, different school. So I didn't um, document everything. Yeah. So that's why maybe it's hard now just to remember or to collect all this information. So right. yeah, need time. It is hard to say next week or next term. So, but I love that. So that's a good goal by next year, by the end of next year. Right. By the end of next year, you will have uh, maybe you want to say, like, by the end of next year, I will have a 10 year um, thinking about 10 years reflection. Mm -hmm. Right. And that that can take time. That can mean 20 minutes a month. Right. 30 minutes a month in your emails or in if you have cabinets that you have, you've brought paper contracts. I thought overseas as well. Um, and I still have folders of things that I've done um, that have made it from country to country uh, and finally landed back here. Um, but yeah, that it does take a while. That's a really good point. It does take a while. Um, so give yourself time. You know, maybe by the end of next week, you'll have a list of places that you've taught for the last five years or the last 10 years. OK, and then by the end of next year, you'll have a more comprehensive list. Your goal could be to have a more comprehensive list of, of things that you've done. 
Uh, Jennifer said, I need to update my CV and portfolio over the winter break. It's one of my least favorite chores. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make it fun. Play some music. Um, congratulate yourself. Sometimes I look at something and I go, oh, I did teach that. Oh, that was good. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Let me write that down. What did I learn? Oh, that was that student. It, this is really a reflective process as well, right? So you might have that student. You might remember that one class. You might look at a course evaluation. Um, now we know that course evaluations are anonymous. However, when you have that one student and you just know it could be that one student uh, or it could be that one student, wow. Um, you read the evaluation and you remember like, oh, we did that in this class. I really liked that. One, I wanna try that again. And two, I'm gonna make sure that makes it somehow into my teaching portfolio. Um, yeah, taught online since 2002 and things have, this have changed so much. I can only imagine the number of learning management systems that you have been in since 2002. Capture that. That will set you above, if you're applying for online teaching roles, being able to say that you've worked in Blackboard business. Now, of course, they want you to have some knowledge, usually, of the LMS that they teach in. But being able to show those skills that you have been able to learn these other learning management systems that you can bring to the table. Um, dreading. Oh, no. <laughs> Every one of them. That's good. I love that. Yes. Try to make this fun for yourself. I think I've thrown a lot of information at you. <laughs> here, but do try to make it fun for yourself. Um, think about, you know, if we think about the, uh, the, um, the, just the webinars that you've attended, go into your Westcliff University email and just do a search for, um, what do we say in the subject line, Evelyn? Just like certificate webinar, just do a search for webinar. Webinars, yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Webinars, and then um, look for the ones, kind of star the ones that are actually certificates and not advertisements for webinars. Um, I'm trying to think if we use any specific language that you could search. Let me see here. From the light center, oh, you mean? Pull up that list. Yeah, when we send the certificates out in the subject uh, line. Certificate of participation. That's an... Participation. That would be a good word. Look at participation. Yeah. That's a good word. Mm. So just something that you can search in your email to start to pull up those certificates, right? And then you also can think about how have you used that information? Maybe you attended a webinar last January and it completely changed how you um, teach, you know, your, your class. Um, and then, you know, you want to make sure that you include that, put that certificate in there, save that certificate in your folder, make a, start making a folder of certificates. Okay. And then start to include it. You know, um, for those of you who already have a LinkedIn, go onto your LinkedIn and start pulling out details. Oh, hey, I did teach at that school in 2006 or 2016 or whatever the <clears> case may be. What did I do then? You know, and so it's really, it's just a process, you know, and that's why I say, put it on the calendar, block some time off for it, because this really is one of those things you're not required to do it, right? So, you know, we have all these demands in terms of like getting back to our students and getting our grades submitted on time and being in our discussions. And then of course, during the holidays, we have all, all the requirements of our families. Um, you know, if you actually block off time to do an activity like this, um, little by little, you'll start to see what develops and you'll, you'll come to realize that like you have quite the career story. Um, any other thoughts? Okay, I'm gonna so, give you one more resource. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, what do you suggest? So I'm, I'm relatively new to academia. I spent my, my entire career in business. And, mm -hmm. and while I've taught over the years, literally workshops that have had upwards of, you know, five to, 6,000 people uh, nice. in attendance or whatever, I probably got a little shy of two years of actually classroom student training. So mm -hmm. I have no CV, as they were saying, stuff. every job I've applied for until recently, I just needed a resume, right? So oh, I didn't right. even think to keep, you know, <laughs> this long form, this long right. form of content for, for like applying for a role in academia. So, so I guess... What do you suggest when you're talking about, I guess, a limited experience and stuff, you know? Well, so my guess is you actually have 10, 15, 20 years. My guess is you actually have like tremendous experience. You probably just have very little documentation. So in academia, we love to document everything. And that's what makes our CV like so like robust. Um, but you probably have more than you realize. I would start with your calendar. I would start with if there was somebody um, or your email again, if there was somebody that emailed you often, if you found that you gave 
talks to specific organizations or specific companies, start going in there and pulling those titles and those dates of the presentations that you've done. Um, I would also reflect on those presentations. Were there particular individuals that you worked with after the fact? Did you help somebody write? I don't know what the topics of your, your talks were. You probably had a variety of them. Um, but if you spoke on something like starting a business, did you help somebody craft their business plan? Start to pull those things out, and then that will actually help you build your CV. Um, I have a whole section on my CV of, of um, I forget how I put it now. Uh, I'd have to go back and check, but it's basically non-academic um, training that I've done and things like that, um, entrepreneurial pursuits and things like that when I've done my consulting. Um, so that is a section on my CV. It's not the academic research side, but especially in business, it's, it's highly applicable. Right. There's many, many, many institutions who would want somebody who's given that level of workshop um, to different business professionals. Note what um, area your business professionals are in. If you've worked um, primarily with people in IT, for instance, you know, you, you, you might not have a CS degree, but you might be the exact person that they want to teach a particular IT class, CS class. So something to think about is, you know, kind of like, where does that land you? Um, I think a lot of times in academia, we think my degree is in my case, sociology. I can teach sociology. Um, and I certainly started out that way, but I've now taught classes in, you know, um, Western culture, uh, intercultural communications, diversity awareness. It starts to spread out as you start to pull those skills and you show what you're capable of. Does that help? Dr. Castle? Very good. Yeah. <laughs> I had the deuces, but I'm like, okay. Yeah. Pull. I would, I would start with the calendar. I would start with the calendar and the communications. Um, if you do want some help with like wording or you want to see some samples of some wording, I could certainly just, just get in touch with me. You have my email there. Um, and I'm happy to help you kind of guide on that. And maybe that's a topic that we need to cover, you know, how, how to put the, how to put the academic and the non, how to put the non-academic into the academic, because we certainly need it, right? Our students need to be able to connect with faculty beyond our research and beyond our academic pursuits and accomplishments. And so having those in your portfolio, I know it's called the teaching portfolio. I typically just say portfolio for short because people do get caught up on the teaching part. Um, but actually we need to be able to display our entire uh, breadth of work, so. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Okay, let me pop over. I'm going to give you uh, one last slide here. Now, these are by no means like a full list of my preferences. I have a lot of tools that I use. And this is also not a shameless plug because I don't get anything back for it. But I do like to let faculty know, if you have not read the first book there, Danny Babs, uh, Make Money Teaching Online, um, don't let the title fool you. It's not about going and becoming a millionaire. It's not a get rich quick. She's got some amazing tips on a teaching portfolio um, to when it comes to applying for jobs. So when it comes to applying for work and that is work in academia, that is work in teaching, that is work in consulting. Um, and so uh, she also has some good uh, samples of CVs. Uh, the hard copy is the new 2023 version. The other one I think is is older maybe like 2014 um still extremely applicable uh, a lot of faculty that i work with kind of started there with kind of understanding how to market themselves when it comes to teaching online and that's a big deal that's a huge part of when you're putting your portfolio together remember that audience is is very important um there's a few other um, articles there specifically around uh writing and and building a teaching um philosophy, writing that statement, your teaching statement, um, really good questions to ask yourself if you haven't done that before. If you don't have that on your CV, you might want to start there. Okay, so I do say gather documents and start to kind of put together your story. Um, that will also help you with that teaching philosophy. Um, but that's a big part. And, and again, I could you know, we could talk for a long time about teaching philosophy alone, and I'm not sure if that's something you've done here at Westcliff, but um, that's, you know, worth worth thinking about as well. And I've listed a few, you know, Center for Teaching and Learnings. Uh, they have some great resources on specifically on your teaching portfolio. Uh, and again, this is just starting points to kind of build out from. If you're starting with your CV, start with your CV. If you're starting with your consulting and your speaking work, start there um, and just continue to build on that. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Evie. Okay, thank you so much, Joni. Um, it has been very interesting, informative, and I'm very excited about receiving maybe requests from you for help to build your portfolios or suggestions or resources. We are here to help you.